Um, we at uh, CSEP, the Center for Social Economic Progress, are really more than deeply honored that uh, my two great, I call them guru friends, uh, have come. Venu Y.B. Reddy, Dr. Y.B. Reddy has come all the way from Hyderabad to be with us. NK, I know, doesn't generally go to in-person events. So this is a major exception. So we are deeply appreciative and deeply honored that both of you have made this amazing effort to be with us. Um, they clearly do not need any introduction. So I won't introduce them, but just make a few remarks. Personally, I have known each of them for about the same time. That is just around 30 years, little over 30 years. From the time that economic reform started, I was the Ministry of Industry. Dr. Reddy was mostly sleeping in the Commerce Ministry. <laughs> After an active stint as Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Finance, his room was opposite mine. So we used to have lunch together. And then the standard practice was he would go to sleep. And we would then keep having our lunch. Um, and uh, he, of course, he was in the Joint Secretary of Finance Ministry before that. And then, of course, he went back to the Finance Ministry and onwards to the RBI. NK was Joint Secretary Ministry of Finance with Manmohan Singh and had a lot to do with the World Bank and IMF negotiations. And both, in different ways, had a big hand in managing the 1990-91 crisis, uh, particularly in the foreign exchange side and, of course, in the negotiations where NK was there with both the fund and uh, the bank. Aru, were you one of the culprits of the IMF who was uh, uh, giving us trouble? I was here, that is true. You were <laughs> <laughs> And I was there. Aru, and you were, and Deepak, he, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was there. That's right, absolutely, you were there. So the you whole team the is here. Chief. <laughs> um, now, as I asked last time in the last dialogue, the last conversation, what is common among them? I have a list of six things. Both are from the 1964 IS batch, number one. Number two, both went far beyond the IS role in policy and public service. Three, both have written very long but very absorbing and thoughtful autobiographies. And both have written a very personal tone. But along with the personal tone, their experiences, their families and everything else, also, amazing vignettes and insights into the art of uh, administration and uh, policy making, both at the bureaucratic level and the political level. Four, few IS officers have been Finance Commission chairmen, but they are unique in that they were batchmates and successive Finance Commission chairmen. Of course, Venu beat him, in the, he was the 14th, he was the 15th. So he's basically been correcting all the damage that he did. <laughs> um, and the, the five, both have unenviable international reputations with an incredible number of friends across the world, actually. Absolutely incredible number of friends. And six, final, both are the best finance ministers that India ever had. <laughs> I couldn't find that many differences. Of course, one always wears very nice thing over here, uh, which he doesn't. <laughs> the, uh, NK was born in, and raised in the Hindi heartland, whereas Venu was in the south, in, uh, in, in Andhra, Telugu speaking and Hindi speaking. But apart from that, uh, something that people like me envy that both are really eloquent in their own languages in terms of speaking. Of course, I don't understand when he gives Telugu speech, but it looks, sounds very eloquent, actually. <laughs> uh, I've heard NK speaking in Hindi. It's incredible, actually. Uh, so both are totally comfortable and totally eloquent in both English and their own languages. Um, one abandoned the IS and became a quintessential central banker. Uh, the other joined, that NK joined politics to a certain extent. I won't say to full extent, 
uh, and also work directly with prime ministers, which I think very you never work directly in the prime ministers. That you work direct with you're locked with the prime ministers, but not in the prime minister's office. Not at all. Not at all. So that's the <laughs> <laughs> so that's one big difference. So. Given these amazing backgrounds, they are going to discuss their personal journeys as far as I know, their experiences in administration and policy making and also I hope uh, their view of the future of civil service uh, in India uh, and uh, future of policy making and also I think relations between bureaucracy uh, and, 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 and politics. Uh, and. I think to, at some point also it will be interesting to hear from them, particularly because f f in some sense with the, with the beginning of their careers like all IS officers having been down in the districts or up in the districts um, and then ending up in some sense as finance commission chairman which are highly related to relationship between the central government and state governments. So um, now. I'm not sure how to start because this is really going to be a conversation, but I'll try and give cues now and then uh, so that we start off. So the first thing, uh, really continuation of what I was just saying, that you had incredibly amazing long and varied careers and long careers actually. Uh, so which were the most satisfying and interesting assignments? Now you can't say everything, right? You really have to think which were your most satisfying, interesting assignments at the very high level or uh, when you started? NK, would you like to start? All right. So, uh, uh, thanks uh, for that uh, such an affectionate and warm uh, words which you have spoken. So, really, I have myself, as you know, uh, had an endearing affection for you ever since I met. And fortunately, I think that that has only strengthened over time, there are very few friends of that uh, vintage. I see some of them here. I see uh, Deepak here. Uh, Vino, of course, always makes me very nostalgic. And you, of course, uh, Rakesh. Uh, so let me uh, uh, address that. So uh, it's a most interesting sort of assignments. So I'd pick one in the state and one in the central government. In the state, I think that uh, it was having been, having served in the, uh, apart from the serving in the district and all so on, it really struck me as being one of the most enigmatic things for a state like Bihar that, uh, and think Rakesh at a time when Bihar was not divided. Uh, Jharkhand uh, was very much uh, part of the state of Bihar. And that's an enigma I was not able to resolve. How does one explain the fact that Bihar continuously ranked at the lowest bottom of the development pyramid in terms of every conceivable social indicators of growth and yet had this enormous mineral mines, natural resources in terms of Jharkhand. Jharkhand was underpopulated. Bihar was overpopulated. The landman ratio in Bihar would be one of the worst you can think of. The landman ratio in Jharkhand one, one would be the most favorable one. So that's an enigma uh, which I have not been able to resolve very frankly <laughs> to this date. And if you ask me, this enigma I commenced with my stint in Bihar, it has continued with me uh, and on a slight uh, jocular vein, uh, once uh, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh asked me, NK, how is it that civil servants from Bihar, when they come to Delhi, reach the top and they do exceedingly well? How is it that back home, when they get back, the same civil servants behave in a manner which would really uh, do nothing to ameliorate the development of Bihar. And can you explain this? And then he added with a tongue in cheek that uh, I think that India will prosper much more if Bihar begins to prosper. And uh, can you hope to see that day? Well, 
I mean, one is still waiting to hope to see that day. But I did have my one back on him because there was a period when the rate of growth of Bihar from a very low base had shown rates of growth which were significantly higher than the GDP of India as a whole. So coming out of the Rajya Sabha, he had already become Prime Minister. I said, sir, incidentally, that one question you asked me, uh, India can only prosper if its rates of growth now approximate the rate of growth that Bihar has clocked in <laughs> in the last one or two years, of course, but, but that was from a very low base. Central government, I think that the most poignant moment that I can remember, not this period which you mentioned about, uh, about uh, IMF, World Bank, balance payments, this, that, and so on, but the most poignant moment which set me thinking, and this is something which I have mentioned in my uh, autobiography, uh, is that when I went to uh, uh, PMO, in, on my first day, I went to call on Mr. Vajpayee. He was sitting in his stately way, and I asked him, ki, Sir, aapne bulaya, main hoon. what is my, uh, what do you expect from me? I asked him in Hindi, ki, aapki kya apiksha hai? So for about 30 seconds, his eyes just kept wandering. And you know, in that little room, every second ticks, it looks an enormous amount of time has passed. Finally, in reply to that, he said only one word. Kya kaam sab kuch? And conversation ended. I couldn't figure out what he really meant, but when I came to my room, it did strike me as a puzzle that perhaps what he has mentioned is that I can do things which is not assigned to any department. So maybe if I decided to do to take interest in education, now that to some extent is a transgression of what the rules of allocation of business uh, would do. But that is the order of the day. I'll stop here. I've given two examples. Uh, Thank you, Rakesh. So of I, I one you, from Bihar, one from uh, Central Government. So in that, in that subkuch, I wish you had taken interest in archaeology, so that uh, uh, <laughs> co country's heritage would be much better off. Venu, uh, um, the, the first job I enjoyed most was Deputy Secretary Planning, in charge of Rail Smart Development in particular. It was I was. Secretary of the Regional Development Board, also doing annual plans. This board is very interesting concept. Some MPs, some MLAs, some Jilla Parishad Chairmen are members of this board. They got a sort of separate budget allocation, but in the but it will be they recommend, and the government accepts some of the schemes. And. The, we could interact with planning commission, outside agencies, etc. That provided me a very good opportunity to see the political factors operating, interacting with uh, the bureaucracy on the one hand and the regional sentiment versus the state sentiment. I learned a lot in terms of having, a, and particularly planning commission, as Nitin Desai, Vijay Kelka, we used to join there for lunches also. So it, was, it was a great learning experience. And in fact, at one stage, Bakshi Minas, in his typical manner, in a meeting he said, in India, planning is best in Andhra Pradesh. Development is best in Punjab. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, we were noticed. But my point is, we were noticed, and some of the outside consultants also had employed work. As a result, Rayalaseema Regional Development Plan became a case study for UNDP. Then, of course, I went as an expert in UNDP, Tanzania, etc. My point is two skills. One, interacting with variety of institutional levels as well as backgrounds. It, it is it's something which you learn, uh, not by reading books. So therefore, I would say that is perhaps 
a very satisfying experience. Thank you. Um, one, I'm going to give oh, one. Oh, there's only one. Oh, yeah, the second one to go. That's right. Yes. Oh, second one is, second one also was with the state government. But there's a fascinating experience where the state government viewed central government with utter contempt. <laughs> N.T. Ramaram. You must, uh, once, in one of those moments, he asked me in Telugu, don't you think I'm a great man? I don't think so. I'm a great man. What is great about you? I became, I became a successful senior actor. Well, that's okay, many people become. But I started a political party and won the elections. On the elections, in no time, am I not a great man? Finally, he said, "This Rajshasi, <laughs> this Rajshasi," yeah. he was referring to Indira Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she removed me undemocratically, but I managed to come back to power. <laughs> The way you come back to power. <laughs> yes, now you are a great man. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, the, the point was, the, 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 it was a different, but I am saying only as an atmosphere. But in that, some of the things he did are not recognized fully. One, institutional changes. The Tafildar system, the Taluk system in India, first time he shook, he shook it up. He shook it up, no. He changed it totally. Mandalization. Second, he was the earliest, in fact, in computers. When the National Informatics Corporation was started, free services were provided by NIC to state governments. Internal said, no, I don't want free service from government of India. I want to be ahead of government of India. He started his own corporation. I was, I was planning secretary. And we were ahead, as you know, Andhra was quite ahead. And uh, the way he abolished the revenue, old revenue system, so he brought about significant institutional changes. And above all, during his period, there was never a communal incident. He used to go in saffron clothes. He used to do pujas. Very, very religious in his life. Not only private life when he's seen, but on this he was very clear. So there are some things, and I was associated with some of the fundamental changes uh, because of uh, that I, I try to be technical, but I'm sorry. But I, I thought this is an, a fascinating experience. Thank you. That's very, very interesting, actually. And so that leads me that. Um, Given what each of you has said, which would seem to value a great deal your experience in the state governments at the district level also, state level as well as district level. So how important is it for civil servants in the central government in India to have had state and district level experience? I'm asking this because I'm not aware of any other country that has a governance system like this. The UK never had it, even though they invented it here. Uh, and they had it in other colonies, uh, where uh, people go from different levels up and down to some extent. Uh, and a, as a corollary to that, do you think that people like Deepak Nair, myself, um, I don't see any others here, um, would also have gained as economists for having served in state governments? I did. You know, but that was, no, yeah, that's not count. <laughs> when, when you start this one, then... My, hmm. my take on it is that IAS is basically one of the, IAS IPS, is basically one of the three things contemplated in the constitution in the special circumstances of India. In fact, that Ambedkar in his speech he explains how these three are not the normal features of a federation. Allendia services, 
common criminal procedure called judiciary. And he says, so the context is more to have linkage between the center and state government. Therefore, I think it's nothing to do with the experience. So we have to view that differently. So I would say the idea of IAS center state relations is different from generalist specialist. They should be de separated out. And uh, it is true to some extent that, that when the IAS is in a way uh, an agent of the center in the states, sometimes an agent of the state the center, but that's a, that's a result. But at, the, at the conceptual level, this should be treated as an issue of how essential it is to the federation rather than uh, I think that's how it's contemplated in the constitution. That's how it's contemplated in the constitution. That's what I feel. Secondly, and since you have raised this issue of general specialist, the issue is sure we can get rid of IAS in the central government. Substitute what? Substitute what? Just look at the ministries now. There are IAS officers. If there is a reduction in IAS officers, where is the increase coming from? How, uh, the, my limited point is, if the IAS is being substituted by good professionals, first it. But if it's going to be bad specialists, bad specialists may be more dangerous to the society than bad generalists, because generalists cannot be very effective. Na? <laughs> Okay. No, I think that I agree with the uh, broad uh, uh, thrust of what uh, Vinu is saying. Um, frankly speaking, I think that uh, uh, read, let us view this in the context of some of the other features in the Constitution. One of which is, of course, the periodicity of the election cycle that you're going to have elections every five years. Embedded in the election cycle is the possibility of change. And the change can be sharp, and the change can be disruptive. So how do you keep a measure of continuity and stability? And what is the mechanism? I think where I would really supplement what uh, Vinu is saying is that perhaps in really seeking the, an All India service like the Indian Administrative Service, and by that I would also add some of the other, the other All India service, which is the Indian Police Service, represent really the need for stability and continuity, keeping in mind the other features of the constitutions, the possibility of change, and change which can be disruptive through the inherent election cycles. And uh, I would think that to be really a significant feature. In fact, I think, uh, think of situations where there can be such sharp changes in the governance of the state that unless you have a system, you would end up in really uh, anarchy and chaos of a different kind. And so that would really I supplement really what Venu says, substitute IOS with what? And what are the better substitutes than what the All India Service, which really comes through a process which we know. On the general issue of the specialist and uh, uh, generalist, I think that's an old, uh, old debate, uh, uh, Rakesh. It goes back. Uh, Deepak could have better memory of this that even when Mrs. Indira Gandhi was the uh, Prime Minister, some important departments, uh, Lavraj Kumar, I remember, Vadud Khan, and some few, Mantosh Sondhi, Krishnamurti, a few others, we, they, they, she did induct laterally talent from outside. But uh, fortunately, they did not turn out to be in the category of bad specialists. 
each, each one of them turned out to be in the category of a good specialist, which harmonized very well with the structure. So I think that the one point where I, I tend to also agree with Vinu that a bad specialist can be really very debilitating and the need there therefore to discern. One more reason is that once you get a specialist, it is difficult to say goodbye to that specialist because that, <laughs> that specialist hangs on for much longer period. Whereas once you get a bad chap as a, an IAS officer, it's easy enough to be able to shuffle him around. And so he, he is more dispensable. The specialist becomes a permanent feature. So I think that one has to see from context to context. I was just thinking, which bad specialist Venu we've been thinking about? <laughs> But I'll, I'll say something about the system, <laughs> system's point of view. In, 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 as far as specialists are concerned, I think this gathering has a preponderance of specialists. Yes. And most of them are very dear friends of mine. <laughs> so they can't be bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ha having said that, from overall system's point of view, I noticed something that See, in, in UK, there is permanent civil service, which sort of constrains perhaps um, political excesses, but there is no constitution. In USA, there is a constitution, but civil service is not that permanent. So uh, in one of the discussions, a politician told me that this is the position in those two countries. But for us, he's the chief minister. For us here, I, got, I have to suffer from both constitution <laughs> and permanent civil service. <laughs> so actually, let me just push you uh, on this, uh, that uh, at least from my uh, po uh, viewpoint, that one of the strengths of our All India services is indeed that they are permanent which in principle ought to make them independent minded where they can stand up to ministers, politicians, etc. But that increasingly seems not to be the case. And but since I have not been around for as long, was it different earlier? The people used to stand up to their ministers, chief ministers, even prime minister. First let me on first principles. <laughs> On first principles, the political leadership is, is accountable. And therefore, you cannot have a situation where a bureaucrat is. The problem arises when the, bureaucrat, when the politicians demands. So the, my point is the independence. Independence should be, you should, have independent, you should be able to give independent advice. You should be able to give independent advice, number one should be independent enough to insist that rule of law is followed. That is independence. Very often there is ego clash also. Either there is ego clash, especially from the IS side, and the other side, other interests predominate. So I think it is the somehow the concept of asserting independence by bureaucracy. No, it should be asserting the rule of law by bureaucracy. Asserting some principles. So I think that, uh, so in, let me put it this way. In the first five years of service, I had eight transfers. By the time of the end of the service, I had a five year job. <laughs> so you learn also. But it is it, not necessary. I, I don't know this. Car. It's frustrating often, especially when the political leadership is less than honest. So now coming to your time dimension, I think the time dimension is that the, over a period, the level of respect in the society for adherence to law and law itself being good enough. So it is, whatever is happening is more a reflection of the type of social changes that are occurring. 
and it's, it's not if, if the civil service is being subordinate to certain political, is that the impression? Obviously, that sells. So I think it's deeper. It's far deeper, and we are getting into deeper problems. Um, uh, in terms of maybe I'm not very clear. In case, this reflection on this issue of uh, uh, how are civil servants less independent or, or law-abiding or uh, devoid of the constitution than before is about the same no. and, and the importance of the whole issue actually. No, law-abiding, they cannot not afford to be law-abiding because they, if you break a rule, if you overtly break a law, it had its consequences. So the law-abiding, yes, adherence, but by the way, it was said about law again by someone very well uh, known to both of us, uh, former Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh. He said, law is the biggest mule which has ever seen. You bend it in the direction that you like the, bend, the mule to move. So one has to also see the way in which the interpretation of the law itself really has uh, been subjected to the kind of malleability which uh, perhaps was not intended while uh, fra framing the law. But to your direct point, uh, uh, Rakesh, that has, have over a period of time, has the independence of advice of the civil servants undergone a change for the worse, that they are becoming less and less independent. I have really quoted an exceedingly good example of the difference between the American system and the uh, Westminster model, which we talk about the British system. That in the Westminster model, well, the British civil service, a permanent civil service, uh, and uh, well, permanent undersecretary, permanent undersecretary. The Americans we you know that with every presidency, uh, roughly, Anoop can correct me, I read uh, Anoop that with every president, roughly about 4,000 odd jobs uh, change hands and require Senate and Congressional confirmation in one kind or the other. But their horizon is very limited. Now, I come with the president, I go with the president. Is the American admi administration better run than the British administration by the fact that it is so much in a state of flux with the change of presidency as compared to uh, the United Kingdom? There I agree with uh, Vino that the far-reaching changes in societal, societal expectations and the psyche of people who choose who are to govern them has undergone really tectonic far-reaching changes. And these are not being reflected adequately in the institutions which were created at that time in a different orbit altogether. Looking back, if I might, uh, at my own experience, and perhaps drawing from my father's anecdotes and so on, much earlier uh, than mine. Up to 1967, a civil servant giving his views fearlessly was regarded as an important asset to state administration. I'm talking of the states uh, because at that time I had no experience of central government. But, but post-67, with every successive turn, the malleability of civil servants because the power of the political executive in taking decisions which vitally affect his future career has changed so dramatically that we will have to go in some time or the other to the drawing board to rethink the nature of institutions which the current system of governance would be best served with. So let me press both of you uh, on a little more specifically. Uh, since uh, both of you have indeed uh, had very direct 
contact with prime ministers at different times. Of course, you in prime minister's office itself, but um, Venu as central bank governor earlier in the in the government in the Ministry of Finance, and yourself in many different roles, of course, chair of the Finance Commission. Can you give us one instance each where you vehemently agreed with the prime minister over the time? And for well, good reason, obviously, not vehemently agreed. agreed. No, disagree. Sorry, disagree. Yes, disagree. Yes, sir, disagree. Yeah. Oh, disagree. I am a jelly agreeable chap, so I will think of agreement. <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I had very little direct contact with the Prime Ministers. I am not joking, except Professor Banmohan Singh too, um, because I had worked with him before. So that's one. one. And even, and I had freedom to go and meet Professor Banmohan Singh. I also believe that you operate essentially through your minister. You don't operate directly through PM or PM's office. But the problem arises when there is a PM's office. And it's the PM's office which runs the bureaucracy. So it's, that makes things complicated. For me, it didn't happen. Second, when I was meeting Prime Minister regularly, I was always making it a point to inform the finance minister that I'm going and meeting him, coming back and briefing. And the briefing used to be essentially comprehensive, not necessarily comprehensive, essentially comprehensive. But it used to be frank uh, exchange. So I think it's the prime minister's decision to operate the prime, minister, to prime minister's office, maybe the way it functions, rather than directly dealing. I doubt, I doubt whether any secretaries will be directly dealing with the Prime Minister. So you were not giving us any specific instance where you uh, <laughs> <laughs> disagreed with the Prime Minister? Okay, if you, if you want. Yes. Yes, I, I'll give one. I, I'll give one. And the Prime Minister was very annoyed. Uh, that was, there was an agreement in Singapore where we signed the agreement saying that so many branches, bank branches, will be licensed every year to Singapore as part of bilateral treaty. So I said no from the RBI. Legally, it's of course RBI. Apparently, Prime Minister was very unhappy. He expressed his unhappiness to Cabinet Secretary. And I submitted to Cabinet Secretary that there are broader issues. And under law, the power to give branches is still with the RBI. So therefore, I would like one. Second, no, do not directly, do not directly, indirectly. And, and you are there to resolve the problem when you are, you are a finance secretary, a secretary in economic affairs. You can correct me if I am wrong. At that point of time, the government, led by Manmohan Singh, had agreed to allow foreign banks to take over the private banks in India. A commitment made by the previous government in the parliament, later supported by the Congress, and therefore it was to be implemented. And the finance minister called me to his house, showed the file, and said that this is the position. And your predecessor agreed. So the government cannot change its policies whenever the government changes. That's quite as blunt as that. Then I went to the Secretary of Economic Affairs and I told him, Rakesh, this is the position. If, uh, I told him, if it has to be done, it should be done, sir. So I told him, if it has to be done, it should be done, it will be done. But I am kindly be relieved so that it can be implemented with vigor and somebody who agrees. Therefore, I may be relieved. And rest of the story, you know. I can, I can rather, I think the finance minister, wisely, I presume, on the advice of Rakesh, perhaps, with the approval of the prime minister, said, oh, no problem, we won't change the decision. We'll have a time path. Uh, time path. So I was asked to propose time path. I proposed five-year time path. 
And somebody said, Chidambara asked Joe Brady, why five years? Sir, I won't be a governor by then. <laughs> NK. Uh, Obviously, so, it's to do with issues of principle, not uh, any personal issues. Yeah, Obviously, yeah. issues of principle. Yeah. So, I think that deeper question which uh, you have raised, and Vinu has uh, given uh, his response. I think that the deeper question really is an issue on which we need much greater debate and discussion. What should be the relationship of the cabinet office with that of the prime minister's office? So, uh, uh, Vinu has mentioned, of course, the fact that if you're a junior, of, a junior officer, yeah, that is equally so you, unlikely you'll be called by the uh, prime minister himself personally, very, very unlikely. Uh, uh, and, of course, you re if you do, you report to the minister if you are a secretary or if you are a joint secretary, you report to the secretary and so on. But I think in all this, of course, the cabinet secretary has the most important coordinative function. This was a story till the 13th of July, 1974. On the 13th of July, 1974, late Lal Bahadur Shastri, when Lakshmi Kant Jha was transferred from Secretary Economic Affairs to be the first secretary to the Prime Minister, and being the man that he was, he said he will not go till there was a proper insertion in the transaction of business rules. Because otherwise, he said there would be a total illegitimacy in whatever happens there. And so, it, on the two days later, an insertion was made in the rules of transaction of business, which had for the first time and insert the Prime Minister's office and define that as a function. That was in some ways a watershed date in redefining the contours of power and redefining the nature of the whole governance rubric. And it has, one can talk about how it has evolved, evolved for the good or evolved for this. That has to some extent a, a very large bearing on uh, the sort of issues uh, uh, which, you, which you have raised, namely embedded in your question is the evolving relationship between the Prime Minister's office and the Cabinet office. Um, I think that some of this has been dealt with remarkably in Harold Wilson's book uh, on the series of Prime Minister and Prime Ministers when it describes the evolution of the number 10 and the role of the cabinet office and so on. And it's an interesting sort of stuff. So I'll leave the answer there. To your second question, it's a more interesting one. Have I ever disagreed with the prime minister and what was his reaction and what was that issue? Vidu has quoted uh, an example on the bank. But the issue which I am going to mention that instance is that uh, in a responsibility which I held, which Sri Ajay Narayan Jha held much later as, uh, as expenditure secretary, I was directly called by the prime minister on a particular kind of a decision pertaining to the defense ministry. And uh, uh, the principal secretary was present, he wanted that particular decision and uh, I said that would be somewhat difficult in the processes. Very unhappy with the, with the response and then of course the finance minister called me subsequently and said what happened and so on. So whatever it is, I mean here is a clear instance where uh, in the responsibilities which was held much later by Ajay as expenditure secretary that was unable, I was unable to, to, to really do that. So there's one instance of having disagreed. But there have been many other instances where you talk him out of the possibilities. 
or show what Vinu has called a time path or what is typically uh, used the word a middle path or a muddle or a muddle okay, path, path. Yeah. muddle path uh, to find. So everybody is had happy, whatever be the outcome of it. That is the more common feature of it. But I think that yes, uh, there have no doubt. But of course, I'm not going to quote uh, any instance of uh, where you worked directly as secretary to prime minister. Then of course, it's a daily thing of this. Uh, uh, you give and he uh, or the are able to persuade the Prime Minister. That would not be very typical uh, situation. And Vinu has quoted very correctly the normal way in which these dynamics of this relationship evolved. But the issue of the relationship between the role and the functions of the Prime Minister's office and the Cabinet office remains in a melting pot. So, um Actually, on this issue of uh, independence, uh, giving straight advice in terms of the law, constitution, etc., a particular issue comes up with the functioning of central banks, where in the last 20 or 30 years, not before actually, the issue of central bank independence has become in some sense a given across the world. So, I just want your view on that, but I want to ask you first, NK, before Venu, because he's answered this question many times, so he'll have a very easy answer. Um, um, and uh, so, NK, I want you, from, since you were not in the central bank, that from the sort of topmost positions in the government, uh, how do you see that, that this whole argument, the central banks really have to be independent, and in many other, uh, in many other countries, In many other countries, uh, you have much longer terms of uh, central bank governors. In the UK, for example, is seven years now, and he can't be reappointed. He or she can't be reappointed. Also, can't be fired. In our case, the Act says up to five years. But in ever since uh, Venu showed his independence and he was appointed five years, no governor since him, since Venu has been given five-year appointments. Only three-year appointments. So anyway, first your view, uh, NK, and then uh, Venu yours. Because it's a complicated, it's not a simple issue in my view also, actually. So I think that uh, uh, Vinu is in a better position to respond. And the concept of the... Sorry, also having been a parliamentarian, actually, is important. Well, then let me first take the last one. <laughs> okay. Having been a parliamentarian, what does it mean? Uh, well, one liner to that would be uh, that uh, I think that the interaction between parliamentarians and central bank governors, including other independent regulators, should be far more intensive than any mechanism exists. And therefore, that is one of the infirmities in the relationship between the legislature and the executive, that the interactive processes between parliament, no central bank governor has it, to the best of my memory, ever been called to the, to the chamber of the house, even though he's a constitutional entity, because the person who represents the governor of the central bank there is the finance minister who answers on behalf of the central bank. But is that a satisfactory situation? I would say it's not a satisfactory situation. I do believe that there must be much greater engagement the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Finance is perhaps expected to perform this, but the legislative business of the Ministry of Finance is so heavy that I do not remember as a member of the Standing Committee for many years, I do not remember of any occasion when you called the governor of the central bank except perhaps on something or the other. That is of the Standing Committee. Leave Parliament aside. The result is that the, that the level of understanding of an average parliamentarian on some of this needs uh, would really benefit from a very, very major process of, uh, if I may say so, uh, domain understanding being enhanced through a better engagement process. You asked the other question on the, well, you know, to some extent, it must be viewed in the context that the 
what does the central government want from the banker? What are the objectives which he has? Now, it's much later that, uh, thanks to more recent times, that you got the Reserve Bank into uh, being judged by their achievement of that one point uh, issue inflation. of keeping the inflation in a certain band. But that's the, it was never defined so clearly earlier and you judge him only for that. But what about, for instance, growth and stability in the system? Isn't he responsible for that? What should be the role of the central bank? Should it not be a contributory factor to overall economic development uh, instead of... Now, the, the debate on that is wide open, as you can see, particularly currently when people are saying that is he too focused or should the central bank be so focused on achievement of a single objective? Uh, last huge question was degree of continuity. I am in favor of continuity uh, for a much longer period. I wouldn't say that seven years or ten years, but I would say that uh, in the pre Vinu era and Vinu, if you are saying the last one, certainly I would say that uh, subject to any reappointment which shouldn't be ruled out, a five year period, giving him stability and continuity imparts confidence to the markets. In fact, imparts confidence to investors, knowing exactly the, the way in which the, and, and predictability is a very, very important factor when it comes to the uh, management of the central bank. So I would say these are my three responses. We need to be clear what is, the, before we talk of autonomy, what is the objective that a country would like or the people of the country, managing the country in economic affairs would like the central bank to achieve. Is it just inflation targeting? That's what it turns out to be now. And there have been so many uh, critiques for and against or whether that should be the only single dominant objective. And that has also evolved uh, over a period of time. By the way, the American example, Rakesh, no. uh, takes me back to just one sentence and I'll that the level of engagement between the American Senate and the Congress and their Fed chief is much more intense than is possible here and that makes an enormous difference uh, in the entire management of the whole monetary policy framework and that's something which is, in my view would be a desirable uh, objective to achieve. Let's stop here. Venu, this is an old subject for you. Okay, first I'll repeat what I've been telling in public, and now I'll share my personal views. In public, I always took the stand that I, as governor of RBA, I'm independent. Central bank is independent in India, and I've taken the permission of the finance minister <laughs> to tell you that. <laughs> but my intellectual position is that the concept of central bank independence is not central to central banking. Nor did it exist for most part of the history. This whole concept of central bank independence is in 1970, post-1970, when the advanced economies had a big problem of inflation. So it, it's, a, it's an entrant in a context, and it's already exiting, it's sort of present to exit since the context is changing perhaps. So therefore, I think we should not take it as Vedic truth, but rather contextual philosophy or something like that. That's all? You want me to show more? Yeah, yeah. of course. This is a big issue. <laughs> See, much depends on what the, when I mentioned jokingly, you see, a government may like to convince the people that there is a central bank, independent central bank, therefore have faith in the price stability value of money. But another government may say that look, the central bank is also, we have bigger philosophy and everybody has to implement it and we don't want a central, they may not say we don't want, but it's not central bank independence. Central bank can have independently functioning, but definitely we di di dictators. In other words, 
the government may not like to take credit for independence of central bank. See, if the government wants to take credit, it will take credit. If it doesn't want to take credit, it doesn't take credit. So, I think it's basically in the ultimate analysis, central bank is not created as a constitutional authority. Well, this is a very interesting subject because, as you were saying, uh, this started in the developed world after discussion started in the late 70s after high inflation. It actually came into force really in the 1990s. But what is very interesting is that the most enthusiastic was, of course, was Bank of England and they separated out the Financial Services Authority. And what has happened is that after the, what I always call the North Atlantic financial crisis, it was reversed. And so financial regulation came back to the Bank of England and now they have three committees. Financial Policy Committee, Monetary Policy Committee and I think the third is called Financial Stability or something committee. So it's very interesting, it's, it's a live issue and what may happen now, by the way, what is interesting is that something that has happened in the last uh, six, seven years, that prior to the uh, last six, seven years, you had economists as uh, governors of most major central banks. It has reversed, uh, not in the US now, not an economist, not in the UK, mm -hmm. not in the ECB, not in India. And see what has happened, inflation has gone up. Um, if you don't have economists as governors of central banks. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Venu had the advantage that he was everything. Uh, uh, IAS uh, uh, economist, so he, he had, so he was able to claim everything actually. Um, okay, so I think, uh, have you had enough? You can continue more. I'm in your hands. I think the audience had enough. Ah, yeah, no, that's what I was coming to that. So, okay, let me ask a, a, one more question then to the audience. Uh, and this, of course, uh, is not an easy question. So, the two of you stand out among civil servants in terms of your distinguished careers, despite having completely different backgrounds. I've already said that you have an unprecedented record of two IS officers in the same batch heading for success for Ashkins. So, what is the secret of your success? <laughs> Please tell us. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Supporting each other. <laughs> so, what do you mean secret of success? Uh, no, how do you know that this is the most successful story which could ha which has been woven? I mean, how do you know that uh, each one of us, deep down, would not be having our own sense of the things which we failed to do or okay, things oh, which that's we could not, then, then tell us, which we failed to achieve? Yeah, then you tell I, us what I, we failed. What I mean is that you are counting the credits, yeah. but there, deep down, could be a whole lot of debits in our hearts, which uh, may or may not have been expressed in... in uh, a reasonably, uh, I mean, no autobiography is as candid in, uh, uh, as it has to be within the limits of uh, uh, respecting various norms. But the fact remains that, yes, we have had our, uh, each one, both of us, so we have had our moments of success. We have also had our uh, moments of great failures and great woes, uh, which... Uh, are best not recounted. No, no, I was going to say, since you mentioned this, now you have to tell us your great woe. One example and, and yours, uh, something that really... So wish now you I, have, I have taken the first shot, now Vinu, okay. it's your turn. <laughs> I didn't get the question. No, the question is... <laughs> <laughs> quintessential central day. <laughs> so this is in the same vein as when Venu was asked, what would you have done at the time of demonetization uh, if you were the governor of the Reserve Bank? His answer was, I would have checked into a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and his advantage, since he's ha had uh, various issues 50 years of his life, he's, oh, he can always check into a hospital <laughs> <laughs> at the drop of a hat. Uh, no, the, what, what I had asked, uh, what is the secret of your success? But then NK turned it around that you're only looking at uh, positive things. But each of us has something we would dearly like to have done, but we couldn't do in our careers in policy or administration. So just maybe one example, and if you give two, that's even better. What you would have loved to have done, but you couldn't do. To be very frank, 
I didn't have anything very par- any purpose in life when I started the life. We took it. It just went along. If you say whether I did very bad things, no. Did I very good things, no. I think it was a life which was led more by the circumstances than by anything else. So I can't say. Though you, I didn't object to your saying success. Fundamentally, what is success? What is success? And all that. So I, 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 I think it's only for philosophically you have to look at it. And then, uh, see, in the Reserve Bank, what would you have liked to have done which your deputy governor didn't allow you to do? What is it? Rakesh, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you are twice over deputy governor with me. With an interval. In the government. I was sent in deputation to the government from yes. the bank. There is one. Comment. And I came straight back. Uh, yeah. uh, N.K., uh, would you like to, or this is too naughty a question? What? But you raised it. Uh, this uh, something what I'd like to have done but couldn't do. Any regret? Uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know. I think that... Uh, Maybe I sometimes ask myself the question that uh, what I did much later towards the end, namely spent uh, six years in, in, in Parliament, should I have followed some of my other colleagues uh, and perhaps uh, moved in the political direction uh, earlier than I did? Because to some extent I did all that after I the period of the civil service was over. That's a question which sometimes uh, I keep thinking about and would that have been uh, as an... Um, so that's always uh, something which, uh, to which I cannot find a remedial action. Much later, as Vinu says, life has moved on and we have tried to do, uh, cope up with the uh, challenges but also enjoyed the great opportunities which life has provided, very frankly. So, and in your book, you've written a lot about your experience as a member of parliament, actually. So, would, you would say that that was a pretty uh, enriching and interesting experience. I would definitely say so, Rakesh, for those civil servants who... It's one thing to very closely watch the proceedings of what's going on from the visitor's gallery or from the official gallery, where many of us who are here have often been there in giving, se- sending notes of possible answers to, to ministers uh, or to whoever is, is responding. But it's a totally different feeling uh, when you are in the house. So I'll give you a classic example, uh, uh, Rakesh. When I was uh, speaking in the very early days, uh, and uh, that time the finance minister was Chidambaram, so, in my asking some of the questions, two colleagues of mine came to me. Stop being so differential. He's only a colleague of yours. Please get out of that mindset. He is no different than you are. He's that side, you are sitting this side. So, you have all the time lived your life in a totally different ecosystem. So, that's a quantum change of uh, being in the house a member of the house and uh, watching the proceedings very closely. And that was a kind of an experience which uh, uh, I would never have had had I not uh, been privileged to really serve as a member of the house for six years. And that's those six years I selected some of the things in which... No, you know, one of the uh, jokes that uh, much later... uh, you know this famous lawyer, uh, Salve. Salve's father, which many of us know, NKP Salve, was uh, a, not only a member of parliament, but was a minister for, for very long. So he told his son that isn't it interesting that when I was a chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, NK was appearing as a witness as the revenue secretary. And now, 
NK is a member of the Public Accounts Committee and is summoning the Revenue Secretary to answer questions. So there is quite a different <laughs> kind of a thing virtually in the same generation which I experienced. So as you asked the question on Parliament, yes, it was a very, very enriching, qualitatively different experience and that therefore sums up to what I said among the regrets. Mm. Often I ask myself, should, would it have been better if I had moved in the political direction much earlier than I ultimately did? Some of my colleagues, senior colleagues have done, as we know, one or two examples, uh, uh, who have taken that decision much earlier. Vini, would you say you have a regret like that, that you didn't go to parliament or even run for the Lok Sabha from being a son of the soil and Andhra? No. Uh, I never thought of anything like that. Though there are occasional soundings, somehow I don't think they are serious when they ask me to join politics. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't think of it uh, seriously at all. It would have been wonderful if the two of you had been colleagues in the Rajya Sabha. Um, if you had followed your hopefully predecessor. Hopefully on the opposite side. Yes, hopefully opposite side. Yes. Because, because yes. all the, all are some of our friends, whom are very good friends of Vinu, very good friend of mine, were not part of the civil service establishment. I particularly recall three of them. Uh, I recall late Arjun Sengupta. Uh, I recall the time with Dr. Bimal Jalan. And of course the time with... Uh, Dr. Chakravarti Rangarajan, when both of us, uh, during that six year period of mine, they were all three of them, and they distinctly added to the quality of the interventions and the debates on, on economic issues. Except, you know, I must tell you, governors will always be governors, <laughs> uh, on, a, on an aside. So, uh, our good friend, Dr. Rangarajan, was a bit puzzled that why was it that parliament was much less responsive or differential than he experienced in his capacity, in multiple other capacities, because the central hall of parliament is one of the biggest levelers of the world, uh, which you can think of. And so if ever there was an equitable place in one room, it could be the central hall of parliament. So uh, it's a mindset uh, kind of a thing. Bimal also had been, but Bimal had opted uh, out of the governorship to prefer uh, a nominated uh, membership of the, of the parliament. But they added greatly to the value and the quality of the debates on economic issues. He did that to make way for Venu to come uh, who would, so that he could give me a lot of trouble to me as existing deputy <laughs> governor. Dr. Rangarajan left in the parliament. Yes. Yes. Within a few months. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so uh, floor is open. Questions? Surjit, uh, one second, a microphone. It's something where I agree both with NK and NK. Um, and this is to do with the presentation of or the appearance of a governor in the House of Parliament. This is a practice that has worked exceedingly well in the US. Um, Humphrey Hawkins' testimony, etc., twice a year. What prevents this from happening in India? Is it the parliamentary system? I think the governor and the Bank of England also never. No. So I think that, uh, you know, you correct me, you, in our system, all matters relating to parliament, since it's in the rules of transaction of business, is assigned to the minister for finance. So the minister for finance speaks for the governor. And in the UK also, as far as I know. That's, that's, the, that's the technical position in the Westminster thing. In the presidential thing, it may be different. We know you can correct me. Uh, my impression is that governor appears before the standing committees of the parliament. And much of the work of this parliament on behalf of the parliament is carried out by the standing committee. Now, 
to say that governor should appear before the parliament uh, directly is not, I think, in the normal scheme of things. It can't be because only a member of parliament can be in parliament. Not mean? necessarily. No, no, in no, parliament no, itself. So, so Surjit's question, Surjit's question mm -hmm. was that how is it that in the U.S. Uh, Senate hearings, Congressional Committee hearings, you have the uh, Fed chief, Anoop would know this, uh, very quite, uh, it's quite common for them yeah, to have but, the, but, but the, here, <laughs> as Vinu says, the problem, you know, with the standing committee is, and I had therefore uh, suggested at that time, uh, as a member, you create another special committee. If you leave it to the standing committee of parliament, the standing committee for finance, which is a permanent standing committee, is so burdened with the examining the quality of the financial legislations, which are the heaviest legislative business of any of the 31 standing committees, that there is little or no time uh, to debate. I give you Rakesh, to uh, really supplement uh, something that Venu says, uh, the last five-year plan, which we all know was perhaps the 12th five-year plan. After that, there were no five-year plans. I pleaded with the, with the vice chairman at that time, that why can't we, this embeds India's five-year economic strategy. Can one day... Can one day you assign time for, say, three hours or four hours for us to discuss this five-year plan? He said, it's a very important point. We will assign the time. In my six years, I could not get them to debate such issues even once. Take an issue like more complex, like fiscal policy. I found, for instance, that on the fiscal issue, uh, you can correct me, my own experience was that every time there was a deviation, all that the finance minister had to get up and say, and this is irrespective of who the finance minister was, was what would you like? Would you like me to adhere to this uh, particular number? Would you like me so many thousand uh, drinking water, uh, this road, that road? And the <laughs> acclamation, they would say, we would want that expenditure, mm. public outlay, mm. instead of this adherence to the fiscal rule. Mm. So the whole issue of whether there could be a much greater uh, uh, process of appreciation of issues of macroeconomic management is an issue I think that Sujit has raised, and I think that's a very fair point. The, the only point I would, uh, oh, sorry, before I when, uh, comment on this. No, no. Okay. no, the only point I would say is that purely technically speaking, there's nothing that if a parliamentary committee wanted on a regular feature to have evidence from the governor, nothing is stopping them. But the governor can't be in parliament uh, in place of finance minister to, to answer questions, right? That's correct. Yeah. Unlike the Attorney General, the one constitutional oh. authority uh -huh. who can be called to the House oh. to depose is the Attorney General of India. And CAG? No. 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 Actually, yeah. Rakesh. Yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead. One, one, one uh, microphone. This was in the context of independence of the central bank. If we do this, just this little bit, the finance minister is technically the head and so on and so forth. But this will give the appearance of an independent central banker, de jure. De facto, it is there. Just this little change can do a lot. But, sure. Other questions? Okay, yeah, Abhishek? Yeah, so, is it so you can ask Dr. Reddy if you caused any non-performing assets. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, but I, my question is like directed to Dr. Reddy on two counts. Uh, one is uh, regarding the kind of behavior of uh, RBI recently, which has been criticized a lot by several people, that they have been behind the curve and they didn't react to inflation quickly. You must have seen like a lot of media writings coming up. So do you agree? with RBI or you agree with people who were criticizing RBI? And the second is, do you buy the argument of the government of the day that uh, privatizing banks is going to solve a lot of problem going forward? Means what would you have done if this kind of proposal would have come? And I, I believe something came 
in uh, like kind of first UPA government as well, what would you have been your reaction about privatizing the banks? Because there are now arguments being made that all public sector banks except SBI should be privatized. I thought we were discussing the past. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Answer for these two. No, I think we've given you his answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I will still persist to give some answer. Then it will be consultancy. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Balbika. Uh, if you could please share any experience uh, from the training that happens in Labasna in Masuri. And then, uh, how much of it comes in handy when you are actually discharging your duties? Do you remember your training in the academy? They went to Metcalf House. Metcalf House. No, we went. Uh, we went to Masuri. Oh, you went to Masuri. Yes. They're not, trans as, they're they're not as old as you think. The, <laughs> the transition had taken place. <laughs> yeah. Any vignettes from your training which you thought was useful, apart from horse riding? No. Uh, you know, when you good rider? No. <laughs> so, by the way, I failed, which was a tragedy, because I had to reappear. And At government uh, expense, you could travel to Mussoorie. Yes. <laughs> and Naval Singh was the guy. But the one area where, which held me in good stead is I had, frankly, uh, economics and other things, I had no idea of that I would be sub submerged in in the issue of the separation of the executive and the judiciary had just begun to take full shape. What I learnt on the subjects in law were, uh, uh, were proved in very handy subsequently to me in my uh, f uh, f first few assignments where a lot of the work was legal work uh, in terms particularly on the peacekeeping 144, one application of 107 and that sort of stuff. So that was an area. But what did I learn? Basically the train timings of how to get out of Masuri <laughs> to come to Delhi over the weekends, take that famous express, Masuri Express, which was an overnight run from here. The timings of that uh, was something which we had also perfected in the process. That was the timing of the Omir. <laughs> See, I was a very, I was very regular attending all the classes in Muswari. He no, wasn't. he wasn't. It made no difference to our knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> the questions. W w one thing I wanted to be know. Uh, yes. You know, at that time, when both of us were there, we had this thing called the Foundation Day course, which means for the first four months, yeah. all other Services. allied services were together. And that was perhaps the first or the last time we might uh, hope to see them. I saw some of them when I was Revenue Secretary and many of them who were there had become part of the Indian uh, income tax and customs and so on. But those four months was pretty good uh, of a foundation course of the commonality. Shekhar? Fascinating reminiscences and reflections. And with the kind of horsepower we have uh, on the podium, and that could also include you, Rakesh. That, that, that is just because I learned how to ride in Masuri. <laughs> I'm sure it's been triggered by that idiom. But just thinking about the future, and you've talked a bit about the UK system, the, the US system of the, the civil service. Your thoughts on what India needs in the next 10, 15, 20 years, with the tremendous pace of change that's going on, the heterogeneity that we have to deal with, the complexity of the issues that's only increasing, very useful to get your sense of one or two or three key priorities that should be emphasized in going forward. Thank you, Shekhar. That was actually my last question. Uh, I'll be the last to answer. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think that 
first uh, a far more aggressive blending of generalists with, uh, with, speciali with speciality. And I think that the fact that it may have had a patchy history or a mixed history or anecdotally you would come to different, does not, should not deter us from a far more aggressive policy in getting specialists uh, in place, not necessarily with the kind of the experience that Vinu is talking about, uh, but uh, that in my view is one. Second, I think that uh, the link mechanism between the civil service serving in the states and the center needs to be further deepened because in my view that states benefit, uh, the central government also enormously benefits with the richness of experience which they, which they bring from the states. Third, I would say that in respect of the civil service establishment, a far greater role for other services beyond the Indian administrative service. I think, for instance, uh, as India becomes more and more increasingly interdependent, many of us who have served in uh, missions abroad, uh, and uh, I would think that the role of the India's external linkages and the, the best synergy between our diplomatic service and economic decision-making process needs to be, in my view, deepened. I myself found that uh, telegrams, uh, letters from, the, uh, uh, from embassies abroad receive scant attention from specialized economic ministries. So as we become inevitably more globally interdependent, uh, strengthening of those interrelationships between other specialized uh, services which we have, also with the diplomatic service, would, would improve the overall uh, productivity of the system. Venu? See, somehow my feeling is that such fundamental changes have started, whether it is technology, institutions, globally as well as within the country. It is hazardous to guess that some incremental changes can help. I think the phenomenal type of things that are happening. And so I think the whole level of understanding institutions, technology is going to be very, very different. So I would be a lot more careful in analyzing this rather than and trying to cope. So I, I, I will find it difficult to build more on the past. So that, that's, with all humility, I, I find it already difficult to understand even the way in which the government in India functions. We, we left the government about 10 years back. So we find it very often difficult. So I, I, I would say very important. But we have not much to go by in terms of our experience. That we, in all humility, that's what I would say. Just one corollary to the question Shekhar asked, a specific one actually, is that with increasing urbanization and increasing number of large cities, whenever the next census is done, we'll probably have 70, 60, 70, 1 million plus cities. So, one is just in the same connection going forward. Um, even though the 73rd and 74th amendments to the Constitution were passed, uh, what was it, 1988 or whatever that was, there's been no strengthening of local government. And with these large cities getting larger and larger, uh, you still have the same administrative system. Would you care to comment on? this particular issue in terms of the governance uh, of the country in the future? My, com my comment, I'm sorry, my point is very simple. If at that time Mr. Rajiv Gandhi was really serious about strengthening the local bodies, he could have made the Congress ruled the states create higher legislation. It was, was, was the Congress party itself serious? My point is, 
any point which is serious. There is no need for constitutional amendment. Those states in which Congress was ruling could have demonstrated strengthening. So it's, I find it very uh, odd. Everybody talks, but actually when it comes to action, including the political parties, so why? It doesn't require anything more than whichever party is committed to improving urban areas, the concerned state governments can strengthen. So I think we have to look beyond what's the political economy that is driving this situation. Thank you. Uh, you know, both Vino and I uh, have uh, uh, been chairmen of finance commissions, successive finance commission, and therefore both of us interacted uh, with the third tier of government in a significant way. My experience is uh, not very different that nobody wants to part with power if given a chance. So the states would like greater autonomy, the states would like more power, the central government would not want to part with it. Thereafter, the three F's, power, function, functionaries, which is the transfer from the states to the third tier, is central to the objective of that constitutional amendment. But the mixed example of setting up state finance commissions, to give an example, which is the constitutionally mandated one, is an unfortunate really case where the state governments do not wish to really part with the powers, responsibilities and so on, which was embedded in that. The result, I don't know about you, Vinu, uh, Ajay uh, uh, and I, we faced this moral hazard that finance commissions are not obliged to give money to the third tier. But we decided to do so, just like you, because we felt if we don't, but rely on what the state governments are expected to do, we will further these third tier would shrivel in a very, very significant way. So the basic thing is that, is the spirit and the objective of that constitutional amendment, is it the intention to really ensure that the spirit is observed in its actual implementation? Thank you. I, I, uh, you can congratulate me for going only seven minutes over time, uh, <laughs> unlike the papers I usually write. Um, so just last words from you as messages to the youngsters who will be here much longer than us in this world and in India. What can I say? <laughs> I have such lovely, affectionate friends. I think all these subjects are incidental discussions. I think good, being good human beings and having good, positive, happy relations with all should be the most important thing. What you say is not important. How you make others feel is important. Thank you. N.K.? Well, I would say that uh, going back to something that Vinu was saying, that the uh, rapid, unbelievable, unimaginable pace of technology, which is rapidly transforming every aspect of our life, from agriculture, from pedagogy, from relationships, from the way in which we meet, we interact, is obliterating one important aspect which I greatly value, the importance of durable long-term personal relationships. And I feel that notwithstanding what technology changes, the need to nurture, build that personal relationship is what will really, it's a, really give life quality in a world of so much evolving uncertainties. On those words, let me uh, give a standing ovation. Um, I just want to say that uh, this has been a real privilege, an honor to have both of you here. Uh, uh, apart from our affection and friendship, this is what we ended up with. That's what is valuable in our lives. 
and uh, you know, Venu didn't like me when I first joined the uh, when he <laughs> joined the Reserve Bank, but he found the error of his ways. Uh, <laughs> but it took him a year actually to figure that out. Uh, so thank you very much. I can't thank you. say anything more than really grateful to have taken this opportunity.